All right, fantastic. Well, thank you everyone. Welcome uh, for joining us today here. Um, we are gonna be talking about overcoming the GPU shortage with virtual kubelet and distributed cloud. I am Kyle Dodson. I'm the head of engineering at Salad Technologies. And with me today, I have Dean Troyer, a uh, software engineer here also at Salad. Good morning. Uh, yeah, good morning. Um, Dean and I work um, at Salad. We're, we're building a distributed cloud computing environment that's focused um, specifically on GPU-based applications. Um, and kind of within that landscape, um, we, we've thrown together kind of challenges and ideas. And what we'd like to talk about today are really some of those challenges of running GPUs at scale um, in a cloud native environment. And um, we'll talk uh, about one particular CNCF sponsored project. Spoiler alert, it's in the, in the title. Um, and how that provides kind of an interesting and unique answer. Um, along with, um, you know, provided the demo gods are, are on our side here, Dean will uh, kind of show it off for us and, and give us kind of a walkthrough of what a project looks like using it. So um, to kind of key it off, first challenge that um, that we hear a lot about, right? Um, this is um, this is out of a, an article from Andreessen Horowitz back in April. Um, so demand outstrips supply by a factor of 10 and access to compute resources um, at the lowest total cost has become a determining factor for the success of AI companies. Um, you know, talking with numerous customers over the past few months, I've really learned that this has much further reaching implications than to those companies just focused on, you know, generative AI and, and large language models. Um, and I also wish that I could say that, um, you know, half a year later from this thing, or half a year later from this article that things were looking better. Um, but unfortunately, um, on the next slide, uh, right, numerous headlines in the industry report uh, continue to confirm that we're in this midst of another GPU shortage. And I say another, right, if, um, if you think back four or five years ago, uh, GPU demand was booming, um, thanks in a large part to a lot of cryptocurrency and proof of work projects. And then, in 2020, there was this kind of significant global event. You may all have heard of it. Um, and demand for PC hardware reversed course. Um, we actually saw it, right? We hit kind of positive double digit growth on that side. Um, so all of that coupled with numerous supply chain issues. Um, a lot of us were really no strangers to GPU shortages even a few years ago. Um, and while the PC purchasing trends um, were largely temporary and proof of work demand had waned significantly, um, we still see forecasts today that the supply strain constraints um, will likely persist for another year and a half from today. Um, moving on to the next slide, a, a second challenge um, that we frequently see and talk about is um, you know, running GPU-based apps on Kubernetes um, can be challenging. Um, there were some interesting chats just at KubeCon a few weeks ago, and a couple of interesting quotes that I picked out of one of the keynote presentations here. Um, but, you know, the complexity of setting up and maintaining device-specific drivers and runtimes, um, there's kind of this lack of express expressivity and selection control and limitations around controlling exactly how much and what type of hardware is required for a given workload. Um, second theme kind of there on challenges with, with this is, is also this shift to continue um, uh, to put your compute closer to the edge. And, and interesting call outs here, right, around um, how Kubernetes is, was sort of set up with particular use cases in mind and, and as we move forward, right, how do we solve those as, as these kinds of these application trends um, continue to build and shift on us? The next slide there. So, um, you know, is there a magic solution? Um, I wish I could say it was as easy as using one of these uh, generative AI image generators to make a, uh, a fancy picture. But, uh, but the apology, no, we don't have a magic solution to solving, you know, questions around NVIDIA GPU procurement issues, um, and we can't help anybody, you know, jump the queue. Um, ultimately, 
problems like these, these challenges, right? They will be solved in time. Um, for example, um, also out of out of the KubeCon chats, there was kind of a, a focus and a number of talks on um, in Intel, NVIDIA, and, and others in the community collaborated to bring an alpha quality API to Kubernetes version 1.27 called dynamic resource allocation. Um, it's neat. It uses a claims-based approach to modeling hardware requirements, and it shows a lot of promise as an alternative style to declaring more complex commute um, demands. Um, and, and so between supply chain and developments that continue to happen with the community over time, things will improve. Um, but how do we weather the storm as we wait for all of this to kind of come together? And there are a number of interesting um, CNCF sponsored projects that are developing frameworks and tools that um, ultimately focus on running workloads um, on nodes that are, that are an extension of your Kubernetes cluster. Um, they kind of aim to run workloads closer to the edge at a lower cost or, or both. Um, and by leveraging these tools, we've also been able to find and effectively scale workloads um, near term uh, and also optimize spend around that. Um, so today we're going to, as I you know noted, right, we're going to focus on one specific project, although there are several. And um, next slide here, we'll kind of talk about how we do it, but um, virtual kubelet. Uh, so there's this great definition on the website. Uh, the virtual kubelet is an open source Kubernetes kubelet implementation that masquerades as a kubelet. So we get to say kubelet three times there. Um, the, uh, the idea really is, right, we create a virtual node in the cluster that now becomes available for scheduling, and it allows us um, to take advantage of any compute infrastructure we might have that we can talk to um, and scale out to. I think the the super neat thing in this landscape of you know GPUs and access to GPUs is that um, a tool like this allows us to find and use the GPUs where they are available, and really it kind of doesn't matter where they physically exist. Um, so. To the next slide, um, as we've kind of focused on leveraging this, um, we're, we're really thinking about optimizing for efficiency for the resources we have. Um, so a couple of themes that we kind of talk about as we go through it is put latent resources to work. It's obvious, right? But um, if you have hardware, um, then put your on-prem hardware to, to use and fully, fully maximize that. Um, but once you have, and if you need to find other areas to scale out to, um, I think a lot of people are familiar with the hybrid cloud models, right? Um, so leverage that, um, scale out into, you know, across these different ones and, and maximize how you, how you use your hardware um, and, and what exists out there. Second big one is, as we talk with people, right size your hardware selections is, is kind of an important theme. Um, also kind of sounds obvious, but leverage ben benchmarks, you know, and compare your options. Um, we have talked with a number of people who, um, who don't always go through this exercise and, and end up massively overpaying um, based on the constraints that we see on the supply side, right? The, the prices for a lot of GPU hardware, they don't scale linearly. Um, so be sure to run through that exercise to make sure that you only select what you need. Um, and that will go a long way also in helping um, address how much supply is kind of available um, across these different environments. So kind of shifting here, next slide on to um, what, you know, what is the virtual kubelet kind of doing for us? And how does how this virtual node um, get our applications running? Um, here's kind of a, a picture of, imagine we have a, a couple of Kubernetes clusters, you know, on-prem um, with some nodes within um, that, that have access to GPU resources. Um, as we create a deployment and we scale up in our cluster, um, we might, right, um, find that we sort of maximize what we have within that cluster. But in another cluster, we might have underutilized compute resources. Um, the virtual kubelet allows this virtual node to present to the Kubernetes control plane, and the pods can scale out, you know, get scheduled onto it. But under the hood, the compute doesn't run here. Instead, the virtual kubelet turns around and calls a remote API to run that workload on a different um, container orchestrator. So in this example, just another Kubernetes cluster that we have on-prem. 
um, that idea of shifting around to use our resources most effectively is is that big theme, right? Um, on the next slide, though, the thing that's that's really neat about um, the virtual cube, kind of architecture design of how they've done the project, is that um, it's really intended to be um, open and extensible with this provider-based approach. Um, so, kind of like with my example on the previous one, right? Like using using virtual cubelet to um, scale out into different Kubernetes clusters. Those could be on-prem, cloud managed. Um, use that API. Um, but there are also providers for other environments like Azure ACI. If you want to go to the hyperscaler um, side, stack path. You know more towards the edge um, or Salad Cloud. What we what we are working on and um, more in this kind of like globally distributed environment of of computing. Um, so on the next slide kind of to hit on just exactly that, um, that theme, right, of, of maximizing resource utilization. Um, when we talk about a distributed cloud, we mean fully globally distributed. Um, there are over 400 million high-end consumer GPUs that sit idle for 20 plus hours a day. And we've kind of looked at this to say, well, that's a lot of latent resources out there. Um, that as we continue to look at this, this supply shortage issue, right? What applications can we find that are compatible and scale out into? Um, and the exciting bit is we've also found we can do this at a much lower GPU cost um, for those applications that are compatible. Um, this picture here is, um, is a little dated. I think it's about a year, year and a half old, but this was an example of what um, what this geo-distributed um, GPU network looked like at that time. Um, and it's, it's quite extensive. Um, going to the next slide here, though, the thing that, that I really like about Virtual Cubelet um, is, is kind of the simplicity of what it is that it does. It kind of just does one thing, right? Take a pod that's been scheduled, run it somewhere. Um, and it doesn't try to do more than that. Um, I noted, right, that there are several projects kind of in this landscape. Um, in the CNCF landscape for looking at how to shift and, and compute and maximize resource utilization and, and accomplish different goals. But the virtual cubelet doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. Um, one of the things that I see is, as pretty powerful with this model is its compatibility with the rest of the stack. Um, so this is, um, this is a model of a real application. And, um, you know, we use, you know, or have customers who have who use you know Argo CD, external secrets operator, Harbor, right? So managing our deployments, configuration, application images, um, how we get those scheduled and into our cluster, keep them up to date, roll them out. Um, nothing changes about that. We continue to express these applications as standard deployments. There's no new nouns that really creep in um, with this with this provider. Um, Grafana, its stack, um, Prometheus, and and even Kida. Um, I think this one's interesting. Not just extracting something out or pushing something in, but Kida with kind of its its you know feedback loop, right? So monitoring the application, looking at what's happening, and then scaling based on that. Um, all of these tools continue to be compatible with this approach because it doesn't ultimately change much about how these things are running. It really just shifts where. Um, to get access to to the GPUs where they are, um, so I yeah this is this has been really neat um, as we've worked with it, and I think one of the things that's that's really attractive and powerful about their kind of provider approach. Um, but enough for me on kind of like high level ideas. Um, I think it's always fun and better to to dig in more with an example and see the real thing and get a little bit lower level. So I'm going to turn it over to Dean, and he's going to take us through that. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Kyle. Um, I think uh, probably the best way to illustrate this is to walk through a relatively simple use case. Um, and we're going to do that with uh, slackersatwork.com, which is a mythical app. The app is called Slacker Tracker that uh, is used to keep track of that guy. Um, let's call him Joe Doolittle, who you know takes 30 minutes to get his cup of coffee in the morning, takes an hour and a half for lunch, has to walk around and say hi to everybody at least twice a day. Uh, you know you, you know this guy. You've worked with him if you've been in an office of, of any size. Um, and the Slacker Tracker is just a quick way to, to kind of log where he's been. 
why uh, forget about why we don't we don't we just think it's fun um product team has decided that they want to use qr codes to track joe and so we're going to add a qr code generator to the app um, they've also left it as an implementation detail on how you're going to attach that to to joe um, but that aside we need to figure out how we're going to do this and and so you know, like like many apps of this sort, there's no on-prem to speak of at all. It's all cloud hosted to begin with. Um, and the cloud provider that they've got right now doesn't really offer affordable GPUs uh, without a large minimum spend. You know, they don't need 100. They might need three or four, you know, and even then not full time. Um, and they're not already heavily invested, you know, in, in an API or anything like that. They've got some options options and and they're uh they're kubernetes based to begin with as it is so figuring out where you're going to get your gpus you know really comes down to a couple of things of course first you look at leveraging your existing relationships and investments um like i say those aren't working out so well uh free credits don't last forever if if you're in that position uh you know it's great for getting started but it's not a it's not a long term and that minimum spend can really bite. Uh, you know that really that really hurts a smaller operation. Um, you've also got the problem of other external APIs may or may not have, like a Terraform provider, it may not have the tooling that you really need. Um, you, you know you're going to have to invent all of that to to take advantage of something else that's external. So. Basically, they've got an existing cluster. They've got Helm charts for their existing things. It's a, you know it's, it's fully buzzword compatible. Um, and what they want is to add basically stable diffusion with QR code monster to generate the QR codes uh, to add to the product for their new feature. And the solution that we have is a virtual kubelet that connects to um, Obviously, in our case, it's going to connect to Salad and be able to just utilize a handful of GPUs when they need them to generate these codes and, you know, run them on, like, like Kyle said, you know, you don't need 3090s for this. You know, you can run on a 3060 easily and, uh, you know, or even, even possibly something smaller um, because this isn't a, you know, it's it's not a high speed. You don't need three second generation times. You know, you can get away with ten seconds um, in this kind of a case. The virtual kubelet itself, um, as Kyle said, you know, it's basically, in in my words, it's a translation layer that takes uh, Kubernetes control plane events and translates them to an external API. Um, allows you to schedule specific workloads, uh, you've got all of the usual knobs available in Kubernetes for targeting those and, and selecting, you know, it's not like you're just going to add them to the random pool or anything. Um, one of the cool things that that I like about this, um, let's go here to talk about that. Nah, anyway, one of the things I like about this is that it's um, a single binary. You can run this inside your cluster. You know, you don't, it can run about anywhere, but you don't need, uh, you know, you don't need special dedicated anything. And since it's not critical to bootstrapping your cluster, um, you can run it inside the cluster and bring it up, you know, at, at the right time. Um, but most importantly, I think, is the ability to continue to use the tooling that you know, the, you know, your DevOps skills, um, all of these things. And you've got the ability to add provider specific metadata. For example, in our case, we've got, you know, aside from the authentication, which has happened, to, uh, which is in the kubelet itself, but, you know, things that, that influence like what class of GPUs do you want? Um, you can add that to your spec and pass it right on through to your backend API and, you know, get all of that stuff to where it needs to go. Um, Again, some of the benefits, and I think the benefit here that I like, uh, besides the the resource contention, is the isolation. And and if you're running a workload, especially if you're running in 
a situation where you've got some more than minimal security needs and you're running on trusted code maybe. Uh, this allows you to run those workloads at arm's length from your network. You don't have to worry about, you know, code that you're pulling down is going to turn around and, and backdoor your network and do something internally. Um, in our example for, you know, we're going to, we're going to put stable diffusion with QR code monster into a container and we're going to run it out somewhere else, send it a URL, get an image back. That's all we need. We don't need that in our network. Um, so we can, you know, we can run that at arm's length and not risk uh, the internal uh, exposures. And also with the with the scarce resources, you know, even even in the situation where you're running it on prem, um, you know, you can you can put all of your GPUs into a single cluster. This is what Kyle was showing earlier, into a single cluster and have all of your other actual you know, production clusters, you call it. And, you know, it's, it's just the, it's just the usual, um, well, it lets you intelligently distribute your workloads around and, and maximize the, uh, the utilization instead of having, you know, three GPUs and three different clusters. And each one of them is only at a third utilization. You can put them into a single one and share them as needed. This is kind of a, a repeat of, of uh, that earlier diagram, but basically you have your typical Kubernetes cluster over here on the left of center, and that green box in the middle is the virtual kubelet node. And we're just pretending, you know, we're taking, we're taking an entire cluster of, of machines, running pods on them, and then presenting them back to your Kubernetes control plane as a single node with all of those pods. Um, running. Okay, so this is this is where I <laughs> this is where I was supposed to talk about the details. The virtual kubelet project itself is is just a uh, is a go module that implements the con Kubernetes control plane API and defines a handful of interfaces that the external provider side needs to implement. So for example, for cloud, we've got these five interfaces, we implement them and that's the conversion to the back end of the solid cloud API. Um, and I think this is the only implementation doing something like this and there's nothing else that's not in Go. So that means that most likely if you're doing this, you're, you've got a single Go binary. Like I said, it can run anywhere, um, but most commonly you're probably gonna run it in the cluster that it's serving as opposed to having a dedicated node or something else. It's just easier to manage. There's there's so few actual resources required for that process. Um, and uh, let's see, the particular implementation that we have, you know, includes a Helm chart for, for showing how to do this. It's it, There's no magic in it. It's pretty straightforward. And so with that, let's... Uh, Let's just see what it looks like. Okay, pray to the gods. No. And I want, where's my other window? There we go. So on the left, I have um, a solid cloud portal so we can watch what's happening inside solid cloud itself. And on the right is a show window. I am going to run this in Docker desktop on my laptop. And um, I've scripted some of this just to make it easier. Status just runs a cube control get node and a get pod. So we've got the usual, you know, Docker desktop control plane running and there are no, no active pods. And start. This is basically going to run a Helm install command, which is that at the top here. So fire up, you know, pretty straightforward. Use that Helm chart to, to start a job. And let's go look at it. And we see on the node <clears throat> output, we see a new agent process running here. And down here as a pod, we can see the pod that is actually running that. So it appears twice. One is the, you know, one is the actual process. The other one is the emulated 
kubelet node. So at this point, um, let's kubectl apply. This is just a quick spec that, uh, do you have that? Yeah, it is hiding. Um, that just creates a, creates a container job. And in a second here, we should see it appear in the portal. Um, status. We have four pods starting. There we go. So we have four pods starting, which correspond to, in our case, four container groups. Um, and I should note that, that that's handled by the replica setting in Kubernetes. Unfortunately, cloud uses the word replica for something slightly different. So the Kubernetes replica shows up for us as a, as a solid cloud container group. Um, so let's look in one of them. And what our replica means is we could have multiple backend instances running to uh, to satisfy that so that gives us load balancing um we provide this domain name this dns name to access the image um, and that can be load balanced across multiples so here we're just doing one each um, i'm kind of stalling a little bit because this can take a few minutes to get started the app that we're running was produced by sean Ryshevsky. Um, and it is basically, uh, I think he built it with stable fast and QR code monster. Uh, the image is about six gig, um, fully baked with the models and everything. So it takes a little bit to download, um, one deploy, 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 deploy. Okay. So we don't have anything ready to go yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, run the status again, and we still show two, two up and two not. Rather than wait on this, um, let me show you what it's going to do. Slackersatwork.com is probably oldest, the oldest domain that I actually do own. And it even helps when you spell it right. Well, this is a this is a pre-running instance of of the app that we're looking for. Um, Joe Doolittle, one of the things that always helps for these is to up the error correction. And let's put Joe in a plaid flannel shirt. Turn on validation. Generate an image. Okay. This always takes much longer than you think it does when you're waiting for it. Um, well, that's running. Let's see if anything's updated here. No, we're still downloading. Is that what it's doing? Yeah, it's still downloading. Oh, come on, do that again. But really, I'm not going to complain because as far as live demos goes, um, this is as good as it's gone. And so there's Joe in what it thinks is a plaid flannel shirt. Um, the validator says this is good. Let me check with my phone. Um, you can check and see if you can scan it. It turns out that these things, yeah, my phone gets it. Um, turns out that sometimes these things don't always work the way you like them to in terms of b producing usable QR codes. Um, but anyway, our product team will be happy and they'll let someone else figure out how to get those on Joe so that the uh, the users can track him around the office. Um, I'm going to flip back to that, but that's essentially the demo. Um, so... That's another one that we've generated. Of course, that's uh, 
that's our own salad image. Um, I think that's it. Does, is there any questions? I have a question there. Um, sure. Dean, do you mind if you jump back? Um, I just, I know you um, applied that deployment, but um, if you oh. wouldn't mind, could you could you just print it real quick? I'd, I'd like to kind of just see exactly what you would kind of set up in there. Oh, what's in the what deployment? Looking at. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so well, a standard... Yeah. Standard deployment here. It's pretty yeah. standard. Let me show you though one of the one of the differences, the metadata that I was talking about. This is the salad specific bits. You know, we we give it a, a country code where we want it to run, um, set up the protocol, the port. We do have authentication available here that uses JWTs, um, and then unfortunately, right now we've got to use the UUIDs for our GPU class. So those you'll have to go look up uh, to set this up. But the rest of it is pretty straightforward container spec. Um, down at the bottom here is the magic in the tolerations to make it select our virtual kubelet. Okay, so that's how we can control which which node and where we allow which applications to run. Right. If we want them to scale out into another right. environment or not. So and okay. and you know we could even run multiple virtual kubelets um, with either different authentication to get different you know like a multi tenancy sort of thing, or I don't know for whatever reason you might want to divide them up. You might want um one that defaults to different classes or different gpu classes or, or things so anyway this is how you would choose among those two or even different backends i mean there's nothing that says you only have to use salad you might use salad and aci to do this in the same cluster or another on-prem cluster right your, or yeah your model there so Any. so these can be stacked and deployed quite easily yeah Limited to your imagination there. All right. Um, I don't see any any questions in the chat. Give it a minute in case we have slow typers like myself. Oh, the other thing too. Um, has, have any of them come up yet? Oh, here we go. Here's one running. Um, the thing is, okay, at one minute it may be running, but it's that just tells us that the container is running, not that the app inside the container is quite ready yet. So this is what you'll get until it's actually fully up it's still loading the model and whatever else it has to do um that's the only one so far usually it takes a couple of minutes for that to come up but then again this is all due to the to the size of the images you know if you run a you know for, for example, if you're running not a GPU workload or not a stable diffusion with a you know four gig model in it, uh, this this runs very quickly. One more try. There we go. Okay, so it's the same app. This is actually running from the deployment that we started. And just for grins, let's see, still just the one. It's always good to leave things better than you found them, or at least as good. And so status, we clean up after it. Still a couple of deleting, but that cleans up the container group. Okay, here we go. Yeah, 
How do we choose the GPU type for the workload? That is in the spec file for the workload. I'll pull that back up. Um, in the solid com GPU classes, bit of metadata. Um, you know, I don't, I, I've been doing this with Postman. I don't have Postman up to get what those UUIDs are. Do we have that? Yeah, so this this particular one is yeah, kind of salad specific there. This um, this annotation that exists is just kind of the way to arbitrarily pass in some data. Actually, I think what's nice is um, kind of highlights one of those examples, right? Of like trying to map things into the existing Kubernetes models, as I was talking about at the beginning. Um, it's challenging, right? Some of these things are not. Um, not currently, right? We, we don't really see these models that we can map into very cleanly. So um, with the virtual kubelet providers, um, what we've done and what we've seen with the other providers that exist is that features and capabilities that aren't natively modeled by, by some standard Kubernetes um, schema definition um, kind of just get temporarily stuffed into, into, the, into those annotations where we can kind of model them with, with arbitrary key value pairs. So specifically for salad, and this gets a little bit lower level as Dean was hinting, right? But there's a GUID ID that kind of addresses and references like the different types of GPUs where they can be very fine targeted to the type and class of hardware you're looking for. Um, and, and so in this case, yeah, for ours, it's, it's a, you know, get the right GUID, um, and pull it from there, uh, from, from the API. So there is a public API where those values can be obtained from, but they map to, um, on the left there, Dean, kind of within the user interface, you can kind of see there's, yeah, if you scroll down a little bit, um, for the GPU oh. section there, da, 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 um, da. yes, yeah, there's all sorts of interesting kind of classes as we, as we call them for, for the different types of hardware, um, or if, you know, there's a spread of hardware that may be compatible with an application and you're looking for lowest cost, but you know, maybe what's more available or something um, on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, going ahead. I was just gonna yeah. say, for example, the the one that I was using here is the stable diffusion compatible. Mm -hmm. So that that way, you don't have to just, you know, pick every individual one you the that grouping. Azure ACI um, would be, you know, again, just taking another example, kind of in this virtual cubelet space, but Azure ACI would be sort of similar. Um, special annotations that you just have to put on your deployment that um, that the virtual kubelet provider for ACI then recognizes and says, oh, okay, that's the one you're looking for. Um, same thing with StackPath. Uh, really, those just get kind of mapped to the types of instances, you know, the virtual machine instances and um, whether or not those instances have a GPU attached to them and what they are. Um, if you're uh, doing it with your own Kubernetes cluster, um, again, managed or, or on-prem, then I think it would just be the, the normal method of kind of scheduling and distributing based on those. Um, so, uh, right again, a little limited, but um, using something like the NVIDIA or AMD node labelers um, to be able to say, this is the hardware um, that we have access to and how many to keep those updated and in sync. Um, so adding those more as annotations, uh, or sorry, as labels on a node, and then using that as part of the um, the selectors that you might you might define for your workload to kind of shift them as needed to the to the right resources. All right, I hope that answers your question, Mike. Uh, Let's see. Taylor was asking about image sizes. Um, hmm. I, I don't know. I think one of the, the trend I've seen, and I'm by far the last expert you want to ask about this, but the trend I've seen is that the models are getting bigger. The good thing here is, is it's up to you. You know, this QR one, um, you could probably pick a smaller model depending upon your needs. Of, of what you're going to do. And, and realistically, you're, you're not going to be using QR code monster. Uh, if you just need to, you know, generate a crap ton of QR codes for some reason, um, that would be a much smaller image to start with. So it's really going to be application dependent. Uh, the one thing we did find in, in our case is it does work a little cleaner to bake the models into the image rather than have a small container image and then download the models. 
um, only because you get the once it started, you know it's about ready to go. As opposed to, oh, now I have it started. Now I have to download. Um, it's in addition just more, to more points of failures. Go ahead. It, yeah, and but also building on that, but also in addition to the standard kind of caching approaches you get, right, with different layers and what you can do with with distributing and managing those. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, you know low single digit gigabyte is kind of what we see on the low end. Um, some get quite big, um, but yeah, exactly as you're kind of hinting at there, Taylor. Um, it's trending kind of in both directions, I'd almost say, right? Um, new foundational models that are being trained that are getting bigger, but then at the same time, techniques and, and approaches that look at um, effectively compressing that down um, and, and trying to run it on lower cost, more distributed examples. Um, the, the other thing that, um, that we see is that uh, foundational models can also be used um, effectively with small fine tunings that get applied on top. And with some of the compression techniques that exist for that, some of the fine tunings can be on the order of just a few hundred megabytes um, for, for some of these. And so they don't have to necessarily grow to be much bigger, um, especially when you're trying to target um, a, you know, a particular application if you're in that kind of generative AI space. Yeah, 26 gigabytes. We've seen, we've seen some bigger ones. <laughs> they do get fun. All right, maybe the last call for any other questions. Perfect, yeah. Well, thank you, Dean. Um, it was nice to see you go through. Um, oh, sorry, one more question here from Mike. Um, you have customers who use the service for inference. That um, has been, um, yeah, that has been a very big growing trend. Um, kind of had that that uh, headline earlier on in the presentation, right? That um, LLMs, Gen AI are kind of, you know, touching everything right now around tech um, in 2023. And and we see that kind of happening broadly as well. And and so the answer is yes, um, we do have a number of customers who are looking at um, Salad as an example for um, for inference style applications um, that that fit on on the class of hardware that that is um, kind of globally available there. Um, people are scaling out um, quite effectively right now um, on on that side. So yes. All right. Well, again, yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, well, thank you, Dean. Uh, it was nice to see the demo and kind of run through it. Uh, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. Um, it was quick and and this was great. So hope you learned something about the virtual cubelet and, uh, you know, check out the project on GitHub and the CNCF website if you're if you're interested.